Hello, I'm Greg Pollock, and you're watching the Scaling Rails screencast series supported by New Relic. If you have a Rails app in production, and you're wondering what it'll be like when it starts to get popular and you need to scale it, well, make sure you have RPM installed. You'll be able to see application response time, CPU, and database utilization throughout the day so you can scale it as you need to. In this episode, we're going to be talking about advanced HTTP caching. Um, we're talking about um, Rat Cache, Varnish, Squid, and Akamai, which are all reverse proxy caches. And I don't know about you, but when I see the word reverse proxy cache, I think, yeah, what is that? So I'm going to try to explain it to you. Before we understand what a reverse proxy cache is, we need to understand what a regular proxy cache is. It goes something like this. So here we've got a corporation with lots of people in it, and it so happens that a lot of people in this corporation visit the WallStreetJournal.com. The boss man then goes to the system administrator and says, hey, we need to reduce network traffic. Our bill's pretty high this month, so what can you do? Reduce network traffic. What the sysadmin probably does is installs a proxy cache mechanism. Right? What this is going to do is the next time somebody comes out to the WallStreetJournal.com's website, they're going to pass through the proxy cache. It can be totally invisible to the users. And when the request comes back, it's going to restore that in the proxy cache, right? And then show that user the result he requested. Now, the next time one of those people in that company goes to request the WallStreetJournal.com, obviously, it's going to load that directly out of the proxy cache. So that's a regular proxy cache, but what's a reverse proxy cache? Well, we talked about how your application has got caching on the server side and caching on the client side, right? Well, maybe your boss comes to you someday and he says, okay, hey, look, you know, our, our servers are handling way too much load. We don't have any money to buy more servers, so we need a way to reduce network traffic. Plus, we're about to get, you know, dug and slash dot, and we need to be able to handle that amount of traffic. So, what that sysadmin might want to do then is put a reverse proxy between the clients and the server, right? So this is on the server side. The client then requests something, right? It goes through the reverse proxy to the server. The server then sends that back to the reverse proxy. It caches it locally, sends that back to the client, right? Now, when another client comes into that web page, they're going to hit that reverse proxy first. Oh, we've already have that page in cache, so it's just going to send that back to the client. So this is something you implement, you know, on the server side. So a regular proxy cache is an extra layer of caching on the client side, while a reverse proxy cache is an extra layer of caching on the server side with your web application. A good example of reverse proxy caches are Rat Cache, Varnish, Squid, and Akamai. They're all reverse proxy caches. You may have noticed that there was one problem with this diagram that I showed you a minute ago. And that is, how does our Rails server over here on the right side tell the proxy cache that what it's cached inside of it is not valid anymore? That how does it expire that cache data? Well, it turns out the way we control that is by using those three mechanisms we talked about in the previous episode. So if you haven't seen that, go back and watch episode number nine. The first way we can control our reverse proxy cache is by using the max age header. So here comes Bob, our client here, Bob, and he requests user slash one. The request gets passed through our proxy server to our Rails server. It so happens that on this Rails action, we've got expires in 10 minutes. So what that's going to do is it's going to send back the max age equals 600 back to our reverse proxy, which is going to cache that request. Then Bob gets his result. If Bob then clicks on this page later, well, if it hasn't been more than 10 minutes, it's simply going to load from his local browser cache. However, and here's where it gets cool, if Cindy, a different user, comes along and requests the same path, and it's been less than 10 minutes, well, it's simply going to serve what it has cached in the reverse proxy. So basically, for the next 10 minutes, if any users come in and request this page, our rail server is never going to get hit. The second way we can take advantage of our reverse proxy is by using e-tags. So here comes Bob again. He requests the same web page. And this time, in our Rails application, we have fresh when e-tag user. So it sends back the HTML and the e-tag, gets cached at the reverse proxy, sent back to Bob. If Bob goes ahead and 
tries to get the same web page, well, it goes to the reverse proxy. This, of course, again, is going to pass through to the server. It's going to send back head not modified, and then, of course, head not modified. So we didn't save anything there. But again, it gets interesting now when a new user comes in. So here comes Cindy. Cindy does the same request for the same page. Our reverse proxy then appends the e tag to Cindy's request when it sends that to the server. If the server then responds with head not modified, oh, our reverse proxy cache is smart enough to know, oh, hey, well, that means what we have already cached in here is valid. We'll just send that back to Cindy. So this time we didn't avoid completely hitting our rail server, but all we needed to know from it was is that e tag still valid? The third way we can control our reverse proxy cache is by using the last modified header. So here comes Bob. He goes to the server. We've got fresh win last modified, sends that back, caches that in our reverse proxy, sends back the last modified, which caches it in Bob's case. And, you know, same thing here with the uh, reverse proxy, as you might expect, sends back head not modified. Now here's the interesting part again, where our new user Cindy comes in. This is the first time she's visiting this page. It hits the reverse proxy. The reverse proxy appends the last modified header to her request. The server then sends back head not modified. And then we load simply the content, which is already cached, inside the reverse proxy. So as you can see, using a reverse proxy cache and taking advantage of these three headers can really decrease our Rails application server load and also speed up our website and responsiveness. However, you may have noticed with e-tags and last modified, in the examples I showed you, we're still hitting the server on each request to make sure that the headers are still valid. That's not so good. How do we get around that? Well, what we can do is we can combine these. So we can use a max age with e-tags or a max age with last modified. And that's going to take even more load off our server. Let me show you what I mean. Now let's take a look at what happens to our example when we use both a max age header and an e-tags header. So here comes Bob with his request, gets passed through the reverse proxy, and now on our Rails server we've got both expires in 60 seconds and we have an e-tag that gets sent back to our reverse proxy which caches the request and the headers and gets sent back to Bob. Now here comes Cindy requesting the same URL, and if it's been less than 60 seconds, well, we're simply going to serve back to her what's in the cache. Now if Cindy comes back to the web page after 60 seconds has expired, her request is going to be sent to the reverse proxy. The reverse proxy is going to check with the rail server to see if the e-tag is valid or not. If it's valid, the reverse proxy knows what it already has cached, well, it's going to be able to serve up for the next 60 seconds and Cindy's going to get back the web page she requested. Let's take a look at an example so you can see how scalable this really is. So let's say we've got a million page requests coming in at zero seconds, a million at 30 seconds, and then another million at a minute. So at zero seconds, what's going to happen? The first request is going to go through the rel server, get served up, and stored in the reverse proxy cache. And then the remainder of the requests are going to be served out just from the cache. Now another million requests come in at uh, 30 seconds, and it's going to serve one million requests directly out of the cache. It's not even going to hit our server. And then if we get another million at a minute, well, it's going to check to see if the e-tag is fresh on our server, and then, if it's valid, serve the remainder of the requests out of the cache. So as you can see, we had three million requests, and our rail server was only hit two times. This is a bit of a contrived example, but you get the gist of it. It's very scalable. The company Akamai does reverse proxy caching for you, and this is how theirs works. They basically have servers all over the world. These are basically reverse proxy servers, right? Maybe one in Japan, Europe, Australia, and the US, right? So if we had the same 3 million page requests come in from all over the world, well, that means basically maybe each one of these proxy servers would serve up 600,000, right? Which means your rail server would get hit um, like 10 times in that same scenario, right? Because each of these servers around the world can still come back to your local rail server wherever you are to see if the e-tag is fresh because the majority of the content they're going to be serving out of their reverse proxy caches in Japan or Europe or Australia. 
And of course, this is going to give you quicker load time for people that are going to your website from all around the world. Recently, Ryan Tomeko released a rack extension called Rat Cache, which is just basically a reverse proxy for your Rails application, and it's really easy to plug it in. All you have to do is install gem install rat cache, and then if you're using edge rails, you got to be using edge rails to use this command down here. You can basically install it as middleware. That's all you have to do, and you can take advantage of having this reverse proxy. The way that rat cache works is it runs inside your Rails process. So if a request comes in, it's first going to hit the reverse proxy, and then if it needs you, it's going to fall back to Rails. You might then be thinking, well, what if I have other Rails instances? How are they going to share the same cache? Well, rat cache was actually built so that it could use either a shared file cache or even use memcache D in the middle. So I did quite a bit of messing around with rat cache with Rails, and I ran into a big problem right away. It turns out that by default in Rails, it sets this header, this cache control header, that has this private directive in it. What this private directive says to any sort of proxy cache is, don't cache this, right? So I tried using all these different methods here in my Rails apps, and well, nothing was working. It wasn't getting saved in rat cache because of this private directive. That made me think, why is private the default? Why shouldn't public be the default? That way we're caching as much as possible. Well, it turns out it's important that it's actually private. And here's why. This private header isn't there just to tell the reverse proxy not to cache this content, but it's also there to tell the regular proxy cache not to cache this content. Right. Now in this case, what would happen if the default here was public. Well, the wallstreetjournal.com, if somebody code it in Rails, might get all cached in the proxy cache, and that's not a big deal. But if somebody used Rails to code up, say, some sort of bank software in Rails, and the default was public, and they didn't change it to private, well, then you're going to have proxy caches for companies all over the world that are caching your private bank information. And that's not good. That's not safe. That's why this header by default should be private, so that people have to explicitly set it to public when they want things to be set in a proxy cache, either a regular proxy cache or a reverse proxy cache. So the next question is, how do we set the header to public when we're using these three different commands? Well, the first one expires in 10 minutes. We can simply say private, false, public, true, and that'll give it the public header. For the last two, there's no good way to do that with a syntax. We just have to explicitly set the header to public. But you know, that may change in the future. So check the links in this uh, screencast because maybe, maybe they've updated it by now. So if you want to get started with reverse proxy caching, I recommend starting out with rat cache. I look at it as training wheels, right? So if you can get everything configured and working with that, and it's working fine, you can then at some point in the future very easily upgrade to one of the big boys like Varnish Squid or Akamai. So now that you know how to take advantage of reverse proxy caching, let's make sure it's clear when you want to do it. You want to do it after you've gone through and cached the heck out of your application using page caching, action caching, fragment caching, memcached D, and after you've implemented E tags and you know last modified and max H. Then <laughs> Then maybe take a look at using reverse proxy caching. You know, this is stuff you're only going to need if you, you know, are going to get dug or slash dot and get a tremendous amount of traffic all at once. You're going to want to implement this stuff. That's all I've got for this episode. Coming up next, we're going to be talking with Taylor Wibley, who's the director of support at Engine Yard. You know, somebody who's probably seen a lot of Rails websites that can't scale. We'll be asking him how he recommends scaling Rails websites and then taking a closer look at how to optimize your database.